Okay. And see it in Google. <laughs> okay. Now I'll share my screen. I will in my free time I go see it. Okay. So first and foremost, again, thank you all for being here today. And uh, prior to being drafted to be a uh, consultant for, for Los Angeles County Public Health, I actually ran a couple of hospitals, one specifically a mental health hospital, um, and it had a lot of what we would call boutique clients, all kind of celebrities, people who um, really did not want to be known for having certain conditions. So I was really involved with a lot of mental health, not just for the celebrities, but for the community, but it was very sensitive information. And over the last 20, 30 years, I um, did mental health training for call centers and also managed a psychiatric emergency team across LA County. So um, managed the call center for the behavior health entity that I worked for. Uh, it's a huge one. It's called Aurora Behavior Health and they are the, one of the largest mental health providers in the nation with hospitals and sites across the nation. So that's how this mental health training started with people who are new to mental health and they managed the call center with me and we learned a lot together. And I may have been on calls with all kinds of people and, and we just learned a lot by doing this preliminary training. So I'm gonna share with you today, this mental health ambassador training. You do not have to uh, be um, an expert in mental health to do this. A lot of universities and the historically black colleges actually have a mental health ambassador program that I will share the resources with you um, at the final uh, meeting. And so the things we're gonna cover today is what is a mental health ambassador? How are we doing right now with mental health? And just setting the tone for mental health. And then this thing that is called the real support framework. What is it? It's really the easiest way you can remember what to do in a crisis situation or when you think somebody has a mental health condition. And then the common conditions, some of the um, signs and symptoms of those conditions. Again, this is not to make you a therapist or anything. It's just to give you a little bit in your toolbox about how to approach some of the mental health uh, challenges that may come in common every day, may come in the family, may come in other settings. And then a few case studies, some things that have really happened, even in the course of giving vaccinations where we saw a person that had been cutting themselves and what did, you, what did we do about it, right? So that's kind of where we are today. And mental health really does matter a lot, particularly right now. So the course objectives, I'm going to give you the current state, but I'm also going to have some interactive time with you all about things and perceptions. And I really want to make sure you understand the role of a mental health, um, mental health ambassador, because the whole point is to improve and promote a better understanding of mental health so there's not so much stigma and give you some resources that you can refer, refer to and also describe ways you can assist. You can't solve for mental health challenges, but you can always assist. And also to give you a framework. And like I said, the real world case studies and how to apply uh, some of these learnings. So what exactly is a mental health ambassador? A mental health ambassador is someone who facilitates healthy conversations about mental health and wellness. And we give you some tools that you can use to promote well-being. And also um, there is a community of support that's out there and it's helpful to have those resources known and available for you. And the expectation at the end of this class is that you don't really have to have prior knowledge. There's, you just must have a desire to improve mental health. Um, and it's not that you will be considered a clinical mental health professional, it's just that you'll help triage, not treat or diagnose, but help triage other people's issues. And I'll give my own personal perspective of what, why I got into this. I was actually at a call center and didn't realize it, but my sister called in and she is a um, military person. And I didn't realize it was her. And she was calling in crisis. And that was scary for me. Um, so I got more training because I felt like I should have known she had PTSD. I should have been able to recognize more. And this is my own sister calling. And the only reason why I knew because I recognized the voice. And that kind of scared me into getting more, more training for myself. So that's kind of my story. And just setting the tone for this, 
mental health is not a destination. Sometimes things can't be resolved, but it's a process. It's like if you were in driver's training and training and there's a, someone who's driving and somebody who's helping someone. So it's about how you drive, not where you're going. So there's a driver and a trainer when you're taking um, driver's training and driver's ed. So mental health ambassadors are similar to navigators. We help others drive to go towards a destination process. It may not be the end all be all, but it does get them to a different place or at least gives them recommendations to go to a different place. And one thing you have to remember is that people may or may not take your advice. Um, in the case of my sister, I got her to some mental health help, but then she decided she didn't want to continue. That was her choice, and you can only do your part to be a navigator, okay? Any comments or questions? Because well, one thing I'm going to do is some interactiveness. So if you could raise your hand and give me a sense of if you've had any experience with mental health, um, why would you want to take this class? So people can go ahead and speak. Miss um, Navarro, go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. Yes, I have one question. Yes. And, the, and this ambassador, um, they receive a stipendios or something for for uh, war, war in, the, uh, in this trainer? Uh, say it again. What was the question, Martha? Um, the, the ambassador. Yeah. Uh, they receive a stipendios for or work with the community? No, uh, some in mental health ambassadors work with schools, some work with churches. So there is mm -hmm. no, um, some uh, people may pay them for certain work they do, but in general, we don't usually give continuing education credit for this one. There mm -hmm. is one that I'll give you a link to that gives you a, I give you a certificate of completion though. So you do show that you completed it. Okay, because I, I, I know for a lot of, a lot of they have the heart for work the, for the community in Latin and Spanish. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing an uh, actor we can uh, talk, I talk with the uh, Reverend Amisha and for tell uh, more specific things. Okay, sure, okay, that that makes sense. And there's a second hand raise. I'll let you go next. We get Martha's answer to her question. And Martha, we may be translating this into Spanish in the near future. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. Next hand raised. Let's see if I can. So we got Martha taken care of. And Lizette, go ahead. Oh, I believe, um, thank you, Dr. Tracy. I believe it was uh, Dr. Cynthia Davis first, and then I was next. <laughs> okay, go ahead, yes, Dr. Davis, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Bill, how are you? Good, good to see you, or hear yeah. you. I was just going to say that um, I personally experienced, uh, my spouse had the mental health problem. Mm -hmm. He was diagnosed with bipolar disease uh six months after our daughter was born so throughout mm -hmm. my our entire marriage mm -hmm. my husband was on medication mm -hmm. but he was functional mm -hmm. as long as he took his medication mm -hmm. so uh you know it's wow. very very important to be mm -hmm. educated and aware of signs and symptoms and what you can do as a family member sure while significant other to be supportive of someone who has been diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Well, thanks for um, sharing that. That's pretty sensitive information. So thanks for that. Okay, mm -hmm. Lizette, now you're up. Thank you. Um, uh, I, for me, it's very like personal also, like um, similar to other colleagues, just like from personal experience and then also with just loved ones and seeing it in the community, I see like the so there's so much need for this information like and mm -hmm. so thank you so much for 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 making time and yeah i'm excited to learn and i definitely want to practice it and like take it out in the community cuz yeah like no one really educates you about this when you're in high school yes. unfortunately and right. so you get to learn it through life yes. but i'm happy that yeah that's all i want to share 
Thank well, you. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, Barbara, raise hand. Go ahead. Hello, and good morning, Dr. Bill. Mark How are Marquee. you? Good to see you. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Um, and then thank you for doing this also because I'm really excited about it. It's, I'm always looking for uh, more training with mental health because that's a huge thing affecting our, our community. Mm -hmm. But for the story I wanted to tell was that I have, a, um, I have a cousin and he is diagnosed with schizophrenia. Wow. And he would wake up in the middle of the night. He, don't, he, he doesn't live with me, but my family. Mm -hmm. He would wake up, wake up in the middle, middle of the night and wander outside with no with, without a shirt on. Mm -hmm. And then we couldn't find him. So one at 2 a.m., people are calling each other to look for him. It was just really difficult on the family. Mm -hmm. And then he's also a gang member and he has like wow. gang tattoos on. So it's been a lot of yeah. issues with the police where they called him and said he had a weapon and he's on the corner by Crenshaw High School. Yeah. And um, so yeah, it's really personal for me. Yeah. Also work in the ER where I see it every day. So yeah. definitely excited for the training. Yeah, well, thanks for participating. And I know I met you in person several different times. So thanks for the work in the ERs. Thank you all. Okay, you. did I get everyone? And I do appreciate people sharing stories. Did I, anyone else have anything before we go forward? Um, Martha, did you have something else? Are you good? Uh, no, no, let me, uh, okay. something, some comment. And then, this is very interesting because the community needs ambassadors because mm -hmm. we pass for hard time and the, the, the lifestyle change for all, always. And I'm thinking, um, because I know for a lot of stories, you know, the, mm -hmm. my friends and, and family, uh, because it's very necessary to, to see this mm -hmm. trainer. Uh, this, is, this is the comment. Oh, well, thank you all. So what we're going to do today is I'll go through, this is one module and we have two others, but we're going to go through some basics around mental health, what's happening currently. And then I'm going to um, have some interactiveness again around the current state of mental health. So what we know that everybody seems to know is that mental health went down even further during the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, the second year of the pandemic, uh, well, actually the first for many, one person died by suicide every 11 minutes in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's a startling statistic, and that was early on during the pandemic. Um, and for ages, people aged 10 to 34, suicide is now the leading cause of death for that age group, which is pretty um, startling too. But one thing that has happened that's significant is there were some policy milestones. The first one, which you may or may not know, is that instead of calling 911, there is a new 988 call number, and it has had a huge volume. And the issue with 911, as some of you may know, when the cops come, they may or may not, depending on who's dispatched, have experience in mental health. So I did a lot of training with police uh, across the, the county to train them in some of this mental health, you know, triage because everybody doesn't know how to handle it. And so 988 is a call uh, number that people can call now and they respond specifically for mental health crisis on the phone. And the other thing that's happening now, just like this mental health ambassador training you're getting, there's also a mental health first aid training which some celebrities like Lady Gaga put a lot of money into nationally. And some of the other celebrities have um, sites uh, that they've supported and funding that they've supported as well. And we'll give you some of those resources at the end of the training. So if, if uh, does anybody, does everybody know about the 988? Does anybody have any experience with 988? I haven't triaged or used it yet since it just got launched in July and it has just been promoted um, in the last few months. But if anybody has any experience with it, um, that's great. But it's really for suicide and crisis period. You can even help get a triage for a person you think you haven't seen in a while, you don't know what's happening with them. Um, and they will triage and get a welfare check for a person because sometimes people are, you know, in the house and they don't know what's happening and you haven't seen them and you're worried about them. So they will do that kind of triage as well. Thelma, go ahead. I had a question. I, I don't have any experience uh, with them, uh -huh. but what is the difference between the 988 and the PEP squad or the PEP team? 
the psychiatric emergency teams are a limited number of teams and they are only affiliated with certain hospitals. So for mm -hmm. example, Cedars has one, a couple of the other, other mm -hmm. behavioral health hospitals have them and you may not know about them. The hospitals know and some of the psychiatrists and psychologists may know, but they're not everywhere and they are very, very busy. So it's not easy to get a um, linkage to them. So there are select teams usually affiliated with behavioral health hospitals. And there's only a handful in LA County, even though we have 10 million residents. So it's not something that's common, but a lot of the psychiatrists and social workers may know and triage to them, but they are extremely busy now. And the majority of the cases they're dealing with are adolescents right now. I don't know if that oh. helps you or not. It, it does. Yeah, it gives me a better understanding. And a, a final question on that. Um, do they still refer to psychiatric emergencies as 5150s? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, those of you who may not know, there's this uh, number 5150 means you're on a, a, a hold because you are a danger to self or a danger to others. For example, that reference I had earlier about the cutting, mm -hmm that particular individual was put on a psychiatric hold at 5150 at a behavioral health unit because they mm -hmm. were a danger to themselves. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. also have seen people who, homeless people in some areas where they've been wielding a weapon and they are considered a danger to others. So they were put on a 5150, which is a psychiatric hold. Usually it's a 72 hour hold. It can mm -hmm. be longer if it, it warrants it. Like we have people who are, uh, experiencing multiple attempts of suicide over time, they may be on a longer hold than a 72 hour hold, but normally it's 72 hours and it's called a 5150. And sometimes you'll hear it in um, on TV or whatever, but it's a serious thing, meaning that that person has been, uh, there's assessment questions that are asked and that person has been determined to be a danger to themselves or to others. Thank you. Does that answer the question? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to share with you all is that um, there is this thing called the real support framework. And it started out with uh, trying to simplify what do you need to do to help support someone who's either you think they're going through a mental health crisis or you think they need help. So this thing, this acronym REAL, is recognize, engage, assist, listen, and then signpost is really just triaging and then following up if it's possible. Um, like in the case of my sister who would be horrified if she knew I was telling you this, um, I did what I could to get her to stay in therapy, but she would not, but at least I followed up. You can't always follow up, um, but when you can, it's a good thing because people know you care, okay? And they also, um, some people in some cases need that attention that they don't get otherwise because they hide it well. So following up is just the final step. So F is for final and follow up. But this recognize, the first thing is recognizing that um, people are in a place and time during the pandemic where there's a lot of loneliness. I don't know if people saw the interview with Michelle Obama. She even admits she got depressed. So recognizing that there may be a need to engage. So the second thing is engaging, holding out your hand um, to see if a person wants to interact or um, needs any assistance. And then the next one is A for assist, uh, kind of an olive branch trying to hand them something to assist them. I can tell you that I've been on crisis call where a person was going to jump. And it's a terrifying. The first time I got a call like that, it was terrifying because I felt like if they did it, I didn't, I failed. But the truth is you can listen. And that's the number one thing is listening and um, acknowledging the person's problem. And that tends to, believe it or not, stop a lot of people from doing that next step, just listening and engaging, not making judgments, just listening and letting them talk. Um, because most of the time people feel they're not heard or not being paid attention to, um, even though there might be a lot of resources and focus on them. So the listening is probably the biggest thing I could say. If you're not sure what to do, just listen and just acknowledge that the person uh, as, as they're talking, that you hear them, um, you know, and just acknowledge that you are listening to them. 
And then the next step is the S step, which is the signpost. That's really giving them a sign to where to go next, giving some direction. Like I was saying, we're like navigators and you're um, doing the driver's ed training. So you're giving them a sign or some references as to where to go next. Because like I said, you may not be an expert in this, but you can always give people, like I gave my sister a list of here's the places. And I actually got on the phone uh, with her, with a third party and set up the appointment. So I knew she would do it. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing you can do, or you can give people resources and lead them to their own devices. Like I said, everybody does not want to engage in this. They may uh, appreciate you listening, but they may not be in a state of readiness and may not want your help. So you just have to do what you can. Um, that's why an ambassador is a person who wants to help, but you may not always be able to, and that's okay. You're not to solve the problems of the world. You're helped. You're here to help navigate. So I'll pause there if there are any questions or comments or do people understand the real uh, support framework is really going through those steps of recognizing, engaging, then assisting, then listening, and then giving them a sign of what next. And then if you can follow up, and like I said, you can't always because you may be at an event or an activity and the person may not want to give you their information. Okay. All right. I don't think I see any signs up. So, so let's talk about this framework. Yes, this is a very busy slide, but this is for you to keep. It's not really for me to go through everything. We talked about the six steps. Um, first, paying attention and recognizing that there might be something wrong. And like I said, some people hide this well. Um, I used to get a lot of calls from family who were in shock about people who attempted suicide because they didn't see it coming. And when we went back over what had happened over the course of time, they um, some of them said, you know, I failed to recognize this was the problem. So just recognizing that many people hide their problems. Um, in one case, I had a person, they called her a bleeder because she bled a lot. And they said, oh, it's her, her period. It's really bad. Well, once somebody went to the house, they found out that, no, it wasn't a period. She was a cutter. So the cutting thing seems to be heightened right now. And there seems to be more kids doing it. So I would say pay attention to that. And also people who stay in their room, they were telling me how these kids would stay in the room and they were irritable and agitated and did not want to be bothered and they allowed them to have their space. Well, that could be a sign if it happens over a period of time. And so if they don't want to engage, uh, just asking them how they're feeling that engage part here. Um, are you struggling? Hey, I'm a good listener. Uh, you want to talk? Some of them will say no. The other thing is, where do you talk? In some cases, people did not want to talk in their household, but uh, going to Starbucks or going outside or going somewhere else, they would talk and come, come forward. So it's also a place in time. Um, the place that they are at may not be the place where they want to talk. The other thing is assisting. Um, how do you assist? And I will tell you, there is some immediacy if you don't know if a person's having a panic attack, but they're suddenly hyperventilating or breathing heavy, um, they may urgently need help. Or like I was saying about self-harm. And then we have people who literally faint. If they're unconscious, it's like, yeah, you do call 911. Um, in a couple of cases, I've been dealing with schools lately, um, and we've had a lot of fentanyl challenges compared to other counties in LA. We've had seven adolescent deaths in the last 90 days. So um, a couple of calls that we were in, I was involved in, the person was unconscious and the kids were horrified and they were in the bathroom and they were like, don't call 911, we're gonna get in trouble. So part of the training that we've been doing with fentanyl is that um, person is unconscious, you need to deal with it and help them. And so we're training the kids on just call 911, no judgment, right? It's better to make a bad emergency intervention than none at all. So that's just a key takeaway because uh, in some cases, a life might have been saved with a few seconds of, of just call 911. If you're unsure, just get help. And some people, I tell them, just scream out help. Somebody will come to help. 
okay? If you don't have your phone with you or you don't know what to do, okay? And then the other thing, like I was saying, was the listening, um, not being judgmental, don't comment, um, and just keep it confidential. Like using words up here, like that sounds tough. How does that make you feel? Just what we call active listening, as opposed to people on their cell phones or iPads or whatever, and they're really not listening. Um, look at that person straightforward. If they don't want you to look at them, don't look, turn your head, but still listen to them. And then, like I said, pointing them in the right direction. It's okay to call 988. Um, you can sample it and call it to see. And like I was saying, those psychiatric emergency teams, I will list those at the end for resources that are near the South LA area or other areas. And also the National Association of Mental Health, um, they call it NAMI, the Na National Association for Mental Illness. They just did a suicide walk that raises a lot of funds every year. But they also will have somebody that can be on the phone with a person just to talk to them. And it's 24-7. And they have trained professionals and volunteers that are trained to do that. And it's national. And they do have chapters in Los Angeles and in other parts of uh, LA County. And just the follow-up, mental health problems don't just go away. Once they are there, they're there. And so if you can follow up, like I was saying, without being patronizing or uh, feeling having the person feel like that you're invading their privacy, then that's great. So I will pause there to see if there are any questions or comments around um, this real support framework, because the end of the day, the acronym is really to help you remember um, to pause and stop and also to engage and listen. And then if possible, like I said, give people some navigation, some signs on what to do next. Okay, all right, we'll go to the next. Is this helpful for people, this real support framework, and or is it too complicated? Like I said, you'll get these slides when I'm done today. I'll send them out to you, but it's really to help you remember. But let me know if it's too complicated, but just try to remember to listen if you remember nothing else, okay? This is really on point for me, Dr. Veal, because okay. uh, just in the last month and a half, as part of the work that we're doing in the community, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Kedron Street, uh, CDU Street Medicine team, I have implemented some um, education around Sentinel and okay. Narcan training. So I'm very excited. So I'm definitely going to reach out to you offline to get information and try to connect with you sure. so I can better hone my skills in that area. Sure. And I'll send the slides that I do have mm -hmm. from, um, I'm working with school nurses and we couldn't deal mm -hmm. with immunizations because the fentanyl crisis was there. And it looks like Wesley raised his hand. Go ahead, Wesley. Good to see you or hear you today. Thank you. I was um, I was just kind of responding to the question that you had put out about the image. And I just kind of wanted to say that it was uh, well-structured and definitely a good way to kind of keep like a very simple thing to kind mm -hmm. of use in a very stressful and very complicated situation. So I appreciate that. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm trying to, the reason why I chose this, and I made this visual up, this isn't the way it's taught. It's taught, um, one of the schools I dealt with, the London School, this is how um, they train all of their uh, psych teams and people who come to the U.S., and I thought it was a very easy way to remember it if you do this in this step visual. So I just made this up because I'm a visual learner. So I'm glad this is helpful for you all. But it's called just keeping it real. Okay. Thank you. I too am a visual learner and teacher. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. So even though we don't, we can't, we don't have time to go through every single mental health condition. What I'm going to do is go through some of the common ones and tell you what it is like depression and anxiety. So you can recognize when a person's having a panic attack. And also in some cases, bereavement, grief becomes a problem. And of course the drug and drugs and alcohol, and then the self-harm and then suicidal thoughts. Uh, when do you know it's really problematic? And some of the severe conditions we'll do in the second module, but we'll go through some of the basics around these uh, today, a couple of these today. 
And then um, you'll learn some of the symptoms, what's different about some symptoms for some conditions versus other, and what can you do to help, and how do you refer or signal to a person, um, you know, what, what should they do next? Because um, you can't really self-diagnose, although some people are really good at it. And like I said, some people are good at hiding. So um, let's start with the first most common condition that we've seen during the pandemic, which is depression. And I had a little quote here because I wanted to make sure people thought about this. And that is, nothing in this world can torment you as much as your own thoughts. And that's for anybody, not because you have a mental health condition, but all of the self-doubt um, and second guessing is you doing it to yourself. So I just tell people to um, pause right now and for the moment, give yourself a hug. And I mean that literally give yourself a hug because sometimes we don't take good care of ourselves. but you should hug yourself every morning when you get up and love yourself as if, if you were, you know, the best thing in the world because you are. So that's one thing that self-love uh, will help at times with depression. And some people put sticky notes all over their mirrors with different kinds of inspiration. One of my friends took this one and this is her sticky note. Um, so she'll quit self-doubting every day. So this is what she has on her mirror every, every morning. Okay, so depression, what is it? Let's talk about what it yeah. is. Go ahead, go ahead, send Dr. Davis. Oh, I just wanted to comment. It's just, it's really sort of serendipitous. This morning, I went over to the College of Medicine and uh, to get something copied and someone came up behind me and hugged me <laughs> and it felt so good. I said, who is this hugging me? And it was the Dean. And she oh, said, I'm just funny. so glad to see you. And I, I could really, you know, feel a difference mm -hmm. by having that hug. So what you're saying is so true. Yeah, and the truth is when we, uh, I worked on the maternity wards in the hospital and a lot of the babies that were born addicted to, you know, drugs, we literally would do little hugs. Some of them were just about the size of your hand and the, the reaction and they would test the brains uh, was fascinating to see if you gave them a hug or if you touched them um, in certain ways, they responded. So there is something to be said for something simple as a hug, or even believe it or not, the fist bump or the elbow bump, uh, it does matter. So people haven't been touched at all, any touch might be helpful, okay? Any other comments before I go forward? Okay, uh, some of the symptoms, people are irritable sometimes when they're depressed, they may not be, they may just be quiet. So quietness, particularly with adolescents, can be a sign if it's persistent quiet and that's not their normal st uh, style. Also, uh, some of the kids that we've been dealing with, um, the signs were there. They did not want to be engaged in any activity. They were withdrawn and they kept talking about how um, they didn't feel a value in their way. Um, and some of them would put it out on social media. And so I tell people, if you can, you should look and see what your kid is putting out there or what your family or friends are putting out there on social media. Um, because in one case, uh, the social media had all this stuff about this kid and the family had no idea. And the kid had put on social media, they wanted to die and wanted to commit suicide. And the teachers found it. So at times, um, the feeling of worthlessness, they may not express it. But um, if they have social media, they may talk to their friends. And they also may um, not be able to make a decision. Uh, in one case, just something simple like figuring out what to order from a menu kept being a problem for this one kid. Um, and adults can have these challenges too. So it's not um, unique to adolescents. So these are some of the signs. The other thing to be helpful, I, people always for an ambassador, what is it, to, what can you do to be helpful? Let them talk and remember the listening. The listening is the biggest thing you can do. And then just encourage them, well, I hope you feel better or uh, have you thought about getting any help? And we try not to use the word mental unless we know that person is comfortable with it, but really uh, trying to tell them this, just be being helpful is listening. And then um, 
what's not helpful that's problematic is telling people to calm down because some people are very uh, boisterous and alert and maybe loud. So telling them to calm down may not help and telling them everything is fine may not help. And then trying to force them to get help doesn't help either because they become even more combative. Um, and then try not to draw uh, attention to some of their symptoms. For example, one of the common things that I've seen is people's leg may shake and saying, what's wrong with your leg? I heard people say that and they shake their leg because it's a symptom, it's a nervous symptom. And to say, why are you shaking your leg is kind of rude. And I've seen people do that, but that's just a symptom. Um, in, in fact, last night I was on a flight with a flight attendant and she was doing it. And uh, she was looking directly at me. And uh, I, when I got off the plane, I said, was she okay? And she was not, and she just started crying. Um, so I thought to myself, you know, I just noticed it. And she was looking so directly at me as if she was asking for help. So sometimes um, that shaking can be a sign that people may, may need help, but um, asking a person if they're okay might be the best thing to do. Morning. Any comment? Yes, I do have a comment. I'm a leg shaker and yep. several people in my family are, <laughs> but it could be comforting too and calming. Yes. Yes. Or if I'm stimulating or, or if I'm watching a movie. So I, I can do it for many reasons. <laughs> sure, sure. That's why I said you have to be careful. But she kept looking yeah. at me and she looked as if she was going to implode. So I just asked her when I got off the plane, was she okay? So it just depends. Um, and, and maybe it's okay, you know. But the other thing is, if you do ask a person and they are not okay, you can encourage them, um, say, hey, you know, have you thought of talking to someone? And like I said, a lot of people don't like you to say mental health. Um, and it's okay if you're comfortable saying it, but that person may reject it if you say, have you thought about getting some mental health help? You might say, have you thought about talking to somebody or do you have anybody you can talk to? And like I said, at the end of the module, uh, the final module, you get all these resources that you can refer to. So this is the depression that is, this is probably the largest volume of depression that we've dealt with uh, because of the pandemic. And some people say it's like having a hangover. The second one that we've seen a lot of is anxiety. And the definition of anxiety, what is it? People have a very intense feeling of dread. And usually anxiety is called anxiety because it lasts a short period of time. Uh, it can be quick, but it can also last a little longer than that. Um, but a lot of anxiety can be triggered by a specific situation. And some of the symptoms is uh, sometimes we have a lot of breathing challenges. And the first thing I do, I keep a paper bag in my purse, but you can give a paper bag and people can breathe better when they breathe into a paper bag. And yes, there's evidence based. It actually does help. And sometimes people are so anxious, they may not be able to stand up and they feel like they're going to die or they feel unpleasant or they feel like they're going to like people. I'm, I think I'm going to throw up even though they don't. And high stress situations can trigger or simply being alone a lot can trigger for some people, believe it or not. And what's helpful, um, just staying calm, encouraging people to breathe through their nose out of their mouth, take a moment to breathe um, and just reassure them that you're here and ask them, what can I do to help? Because some people have anxiety a lot and they know what helps them. In some cases, um, people have told me they just need to hold somebody's hand, which ended up being mine, or they just needed to uh, find a quiet place, or can you get me some water? So they tell you, they ask them what would help. They may know what helps them, okay? What's not helpful is when people say, just snap out of it. I've heard parents tell their kids this, and um, I know how my mother was. She was very authoritarian. So if she told you that, you she meant, she meant it but that doesn't necessarily work with everyone. 
And also people saying, well, just smile or look at the bright side. When people are having a lot of anxiety, um, some of this can trigger them to go even, even more into the anxiety. So you may not want to focus on providing suggestions. You might just want to listen and make sure you ask them, what can I do to help? And if you don't know what to do, uh, try to help them with the breathing. Just take deep breaths. Um, and that usually slows people's uh, pulse down and slows their anxiety down. And that is an evidence-based thing that it really does help. And what can you do to triage? Um, encourage them if you think they really need to. Is there anybody you can talk to? Um, and there are also crisis hotlines that I'll give you at the end of the you know modules that can help. And sometimes okay. I've been on the phone as on the call center phone as much as two hours with an individual. And so sometimes it's a lot of time. So you may not have that time to give to a person. That's why the hot helplines can help. Or if there's somebody they feel comfortable talking to, I have literally gotten on the phone, give me the person's cell phone number, I'll call them for you. Um, and they've gotten on the phone with them until they could calm down. Um, and sometimes that just helps. There's a person they've identified that helps calm them down. In some cases, when you ask them what would help, um, I wanna talk to so-and-so or nothing will help me. So you might just have to listen to them, okay? Are there any questions or comments about the anxiety? How is that different from depression? Do people get a sense of it or not? Any comments? Okay. All right, no hands raised, so we'll go to the next one. The next condition is when a person is actually having a panic attack. It's anxiety plus some, we call it. So um, this is when, what, what is it? It's when a person has a high level of worry and it's persistent. It's not a quick hit. Um, there, there's a short duration versus longer for anxiety. A panic attack normally uh, lasts a shorter period of time. And people have panic attacks sometimes have some of these other conditions like post-traumatic stress. And post-traumatic stress isn't just for military. It could be trauma from childhood trauma. We have people who have witnessed so many violent episodes of shootings and killings that they have kind of a permanent state of trauma. And also um, the people who repeat things over and over again, the OCD as we call it, the uh, those who repeat stuff, we have people who have more panic attacks in some cases that have those conditions where they're, everything's repetitive and needs to be in order. And when it's not, they literally panic. Um, so those are a couple of definitions here about the high level of worry, persistent anxiousness, and then they have a rapid breathing. And they may be tense, some of the symptoms, they may be tension, tense and edgy, um, they can also be withdrawn or they can be um, in a high stress situation that can trigger them. What's helpful is letting them talk, again, listening and reassuring them. Um, and you have to understand that even though their fears may be irrational, like we had a woman who she would always have a panic attack when she went to a particular place and she would tell us she's seeing snakes. And she knew it was irrational. She said, I know this is crazy. Um, and she knew it, but she still always, this particular place and time would trigger her. So we tried to find her an alternative place to go to where she picked up her medicines because sometimes this particular place triggered her. What's not helpful is telling people to snap out of it. I've heard people, um, and at times when we've had different entities come to help with the situation, they just tell them to snap out of it. And that's not helpful. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, I've seen them get worse and I had to get the paper bag out or to smile and look on the bright side and stop this. Um, so like I said, this is another one where you just have to listen and uh, let people get through it by helping them breathe or encouraging them to speak. Can you talk? What might help you? So uh, some self-help strategies can be helpful. We had a couple of adults who use things like their own teddy bear, childhood doll, 
They use stress balls, they kept in their purse. So different things may help different people. And uh, if it's helpful for them, then we go with it. I had a person who they said, get this particular um, handkerchief out. And they held that handkerchief because it was in memory of somebody they had lost and that helped them. So whatever it is, uh, we, you just have to go with it. And it does usually subside the panic attacks too. Uh, some people may go into fainting though, and you do need to call 911. Any questions or comments about that? Has anyone ever seen anyone have a panic attack on the call? Yes, I have. Okay, go ahead. Explain what happened. <laughs> In the in the field, first of all, I have panic attacks every now and then, so I'm very sure. familiar with them. And um, it, um, you, I guess I've tried to talk them down or let them, you know, ask them to do breathing exercises. So I am aware of the breathing exercises. And I guess the most severe situation that I've seen is that sometimes they feel the need to escape. Mm -hmm. To, um, yeah, they need to get a front, they get, they need to get out of the way, you know, and then what can you do? Cause they'll run off, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll run away. And that's when it gets kind of hairy. Yes. Um, I have family members on drugs, substance abuse. And mm -hmm. sometimes if they feel trapped, they'll go into panic mode or, mm -hmm. um, if they ask you for something and you tell them why they can't you know, have the money they want to do what they want to do or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they get panicky and upset and mm -hmm. sometimes even combative. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That's when you have to get out of the way sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And it's okay. If a person is a runner, there's nothing you can do other than if you think they're going to run because they're going to attempt some self-harm, then you do need to call help. But other than that, it's like you said, um, sometimes you also have to get out of the way. That you remember, mm -hmm. you're just an ambassador trying to help navigate, so you might have to get out of the way, and that's okay, right? Because sometimes they do get aggressive, yes, yes. Okay, so let's go to the next one, which is drugs and alcohol, which, as you all know, is quite pervasive. So, um, what's the definition of when a person is considered having a mental health condition? with drugs and or alcohol. It's when it impairs normal life function. I have experienced engagement with a lot of people who are what we so, call functional alcoholic or functional drug addict. That means they may um, hide it and do it on the weekend and then they come to work or they do it in the evenings and people are not aware when they come to work or when they're in social settings, that's, what's, um, that's what they have. So, uh, the definition is impairing normal life function, but the truth is a person can be functional and still have uh, drug and alcohol problems. And they use it to cope with an underlying condition. It's like we call it self-medication because it makes you feel better in the short term. And it becomes a cycle um, when it's considered a mental health condition. It's not like a one-off and a binge that happened over the weekend. A uh, symptom is binge drinking or binge drugging. And usually they start missing work or activities and they may have a high tolerance. Um, I've seen people do a lot of things and I'm always amazed how much tolerance their body can take. Um, and they may have heavy use outside of a social setting. So they may do it in isolation or with other people outside of a social activity and they tend to eventually start missing commitments or scheduling. So those are some of the signs. They don't show up or they're always late. Or in one case that I'm dealing with, with uh, that's a private case, um, the person keeps coming to work late and then they don't remember that they're late or don't remember that everybody was trying to get in touch with them. Um, definitely symptoms that something's not right. Um, the other thing is, what can you do to be helpful? Encourage a conversation. Again, that listening and being supportive. And you have to ask them, hey, are you okay? Is there something you want to change? Because some people don't want help. They have to want it. And long term, um, just encouraging somebody to get help. Uh, sometimes the 
as opposed to just going directly to the primary care physician or health professional, sometimes going to those support groups might be a first step before people do the other stuff where they go get real help. And what I mean by real help, I mean a professional clinical help, but at least it's a start to get people to go to uh, get some support. What's not helpful is um, I've seen people get really combative when people call them an addict or a drunk um, because they were angry and they were combative and they were in a social setting and they blew up uh, somebody's event. And um, we kind of calm these people down and just kind of talk them through without giving them suggestions, just listening, what's wrong? Um, do you realize that you know, you just did such and such. And at times people don't, they're, they don't even remember what they've done because they're just that, what we call lit, they're just that uh, intoxicated. So what do you do? Just encourage them to speak. I always tell people, try to get them to go to their healthcare professional first, because there may be other things going on that they're self-medicating for, for. I can't tell you how many people we've had that had cancer and they self-medicated, not realizing they may have had cancer or some other condition, even lupus. And that's what was driving them to try to medicate. And so the primary care person or healthcare professional or nurse practitioner identified their underlying condition. And that actually helped uh, pivot the behavior. But they had no idea that's what was causing uh, them to go towards self-medication. They just know they had pain. So... Um, any comments or questions about that? I see someone in the chat. So let me see what the chat is. Okay. Oh, so you've been a Red Cross instructor for almost 40 years. That's great. So we definitely need instructors. So thanks for that. Okay. Any other comments or questions before I go on? We have about five minutes left. Okay. Let's go to the next one. And the next, the self-harm is a major one because this is not, was not as pervasive as it is now or people weren't as aware of it. And what is self-harm is intentionally injuring yourself. And usually there's some underlying emotional reason and it's most common in young people. It can be everything from cutting themselves. The symptoms are cutting, scratching. It can also be hitting themselves, um, pulling their hair. They may burn themselves. And what we see is there's these bruises and they're often unable to explain. And they may be very good at covering up. I had a young girl who had on turtlenecks and it was you know, hundred degrees outside. And I was trying to figure it out and Finally, I got her to trust me. And when she showed me, she had been um, burning herself in different spots. And so they may be good at covering up and the family didn't notice this, but it was one of those things that like, we don't know what's wrong with her, um, but they didn't notice the, the way she was covering up her whole body with clothes when she used to wear a lot of more revealing things. And what's helpful is being open and honest and again, um, letting people, a lot of people struggle with, with situations. So uh, is there something you're struggling with or are you want to talk about? So just trying to keep it very, very low level in terms of engaging. What's well, not helpful, if you try to get people to stop abruptly, usually they just go worse. Um, and also making them feel guilty. Like I heard one person say, what is wrong with you? That did not help at all. It actually made the person wor worse or using words like cutter or self-harm. Um, they don't take well to those words normally. The adolescents don't. So what can you do? You really, they really need to see a healthcare professional if they can. And there may be an immediate need. At times we've had to call 911 because we see these injuries and they are threatening and they may be severe and they really do need help. Um, so I will stop at that. I'm sorry, this is kind of not positive stuff, but the positive part of it is you're learning about something that you could actually help navigate somebody, or at least you'll know in the future how to be able to um, you know, see the signs and symptoms. And uh, the next module will have a few more uh, things like suicidal thoughts, how to identify, and uh, we'll go over uh, some case studies. 
So Dr. Davis, you have a comment before we close? I just had a quick question for you since you've worked in the field for so long. Mm -hmm. I have a colleague who one of her children has had these mental health issues for a long, long time from the self-harm to having to be institutionalized, mm -hmm. put on medication, on mm -hmm. drugs. And she and she's now approaching 40 and mm -hmm. and nothing is seeming to help. Mm -hmm. He recently even tried to harm her mother. So do you give up on people? What what do you do when after years and decades and you make all these efforts to support and help, but yeah. it's not getting any better. Yeah. Um, do do you do they recommend institutionalizing someone, especially if if they're they're a harm to themselves or other people or their children? Yeah. Usually they would recommend that they try alternative therapy. And what that means is that maybe it's the therapeutic uh, engagement. Say, for example, we ended up sending um, a couple of people to a horse for farm and they engaged with the horses and um, they also got different therapeutic approaches. So that may be one. But at times people might need to be institutionalized, but that's for um other clinical people to engage with them and try an alternative uh, clinician to engage. That's what I would tell you. Thank you. Right. And Lizette, did you have another hand up? Yes, I had a question. I, I'm very curious. Um, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Um, so then my question is like, I'm curious to know if you have like, um, cause I know Met, it's changing a lot, just attending other public health, mental health uh, conversations mm -hmm. about like the practice of Western medicine, how it's like, mm -hmm. it's very different, but I wonder if you've approached it, like including like Eastern or indigenous mm -hmm. medicine or like looked into that because I feel that yes. that's a rising conversation recently um, yes. of how we can heal people through, through like these different approaches and yeah, there's more research to be done, but I don't know if you've heard of anything. Yeah, I've heard a lot about um, using um, the breathing and the um, there's apps that people have been using that help with mental health. And there's a free one for anybody who's a resident of the LA County that I also provide. So mm -hmm. yes, I've heard acupuncture, other things that have helped people that are evidence-based. There's a lot of research being done mm -hmm. about alternatives. So yes, you're right. And when I do the resources, um, I'll have a few of those, Lizette, in the- Okay, thank you so much, okay. thank you. Okay, well, it looks like we're at time, so we'll see you next Magic Monday for those of you who are going to be around, and I will email the um, presentation out for today, and uh, see you next Monday. Thank you all for your um, attention. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.